It is such a delight to be interviewing Dr. Richard Miller today in San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Miller, you are the founder and chair of iRest Institute, and you're the developer of iRest Yoga Nidra Meditation. I'm going to start by asking you, what is Yoga Nidra? Yoga, for me, means this sense of not separate. So everything is interconnected or part of an underlying essence. And the word nidra, which in Sanskrit means sleep, actually means a changing state of consciousness. So that could be happiness, sadness, waking, sleeping. So yoga nidra, when you put the two words together, means to know yourself as this underlying non-separate essence from everything around you, no matter the changing state of your consciousness. So that means... We could be happy, we could be sad, we could be waking, we could be dreaming, and yet we know ourselves as this underlying essence that's given birth to each of us and the entire cosmos. So Yoga Nidra is a practice, we might say, that helps us realize both this ineffable mystery, this underlying essence that is given birth to all of us, that interconnects us all, And it also teaches ways of learning how to be with all the changing states of consciousness while we're embodying this wakeful understanding. I certainly see it as providing teachings and tools that give us a way of living our life that moves us from fear to that deep sense of peace. When especially we recognize We're not here to get rid of fear. We're here to follow it to where we're separating and bring us home. There's a a wonderful saying, the opposite of fear is love. Love has no opposite that pathes all understanding. We are learning to really be with our fear and use it to come back to source where it brings us back to that essence of love that we truly are. Would you say then it's fair to say it's a technology or a tool for expanded consciousness? I like to think of it as both an art and a science. So there is a science behind it, and I've been doing research on it to understand how and with whom it works. But it really is an art. I I like to think of Yoga Nidra and and the perspective that I teach out of as an owner's manual that none of us got when we were children, of really how to be this awake essence amidst the daily life and the ins and outs of all the different changes we all go through. So you mentioned emotions. You mentioned happy, sad the full spectrum. So does yoga nidra help me feel the fullness of all of those emotions, even the polarized opposites? Yoga nidra is designed actually to help you realize your full potential as a human being. So that means you have the entire repertoire of emotions, thoughts, body sensations, every perception. So it increases your sensitivity to be aware of these different movements, we might say that our emotions, thoughts, body sensations, perceptions, the five senses, the movement of attention, the movements of the mind. And it's, I really think of it as as a laboratory where we're really coming to understand who we are as a human being and all of our capacities and how to be relational both with ourself and with whomever we're with or whatever circumstance we're in. There's a a beautiful line from the Brihadarankya Upanishad, thousands of years old, and it basically says, whenever we separate from ourself in the slightest degree, there will be a movement of some distress, some anxiety, some fear, some kind of an emotional response in our body that, that we feel at a very sensorial level as feedback that we're starting to separate. So yoga nidra is designed to help us recognize all of our emotions, our thoughts as messengers 
that our body is sending to us constantly that is helping us stay in harmony both with ourself and the universe around us and the person who's in front of us. So we're responsive rather than reactive. I like the sound of that. So you're telling me that the yogis knew or have known for thousands of years that our emotions are, say, a guidance system? Uh, yeah, a guidance system. Um, I think of them as signal flares that our body is sending up to us all the time. And our ability to be sensitive to them at ever subtler levels allows us to respond to them more quickly than if we're not sensitive. Then they have to get almost like they're shouting at us. And I see for most people, they have to get at a very long way along that continuum until their emotions are really shouting at them for them to listen and then begin to respond. And the, the cue here, I think, is really important. And you're, what you're saying is actually kind of bringing it out, which is the emotions and our thoughts, perceptions, they're not things that we're trying to change or get rid of. We're actually learning how to listen to them so they can help, in a way, be a guidance system for us to really learn how to navigate our life moment to moment in a very fluid and organic very authentic and spontaneous manner. It's really interesting you say that because you really hit home there. I took it to such an extreme where I was near death. I had a near death experience due to alcoholism because I went to such extremes to escape my emotions. I was not taught how to deal with them. I did not know how to transcend emotions, how to stay with emo an emotion. I didn't realize that that was behind my anxiety issues, mm -hmm. you know? And, and the, to know now that there are tools out there and there's knowledge that can help so many people suffering who don't even know that they're suffering or, you know, perhaps to, to the great extent that which they might be suffering. And it is true, isn't it? We have to all sometimes go to very extreme places before we finally realize this isn't working and we start to look at alternatives. I was much like you. I was very depressed. I was very disconnected. I was raised in a culture that didn't foster a sense of interconnectedness. It fosters a sense of love but that love isn't always one that's appreciating who we are as an individuated and unique human being. So I, perhaps like you, lost my way. The further I got away from myself, the more those cues in my body, emotions and different sensations started ramping up. And probably like you, I tried all sorts of ways, each one that failed. So actually I look back and each one of those to me was good news. They were trials. They ultimately failed and brought me back to really the only place that works, which is to welcome myself, all my emotions, all my thoughts, and learn how to use them, as we were saying, as guidance systems back in to where I was separating from myself. And that's what I try to teach when I'm working with people in Yoga Nidra is how to listen to their emotions, which are cues helping them orient to where are you separating? Because when we stop separating, those emotions have served their purpose and they will naturally resolve and dissolve. So we don't need actually to learn how to transcend them, go beyond them. We're learning how to be with them. And then there's a natural uh, disidentification, a natural transcendence that happens because they've served their purpose and they're no longer necessary. Yes, and it's the body that keeps the score. There's a book obviously titled... By what? Bessel van der Kolk, who's yeah. a friend of mine. And yeah, the body keeps store. It always knows what's going on. And, and I think there's a clarity then. We're learning how to be with the messengers, like emotions that are taking us away, that are arising when we're separating from ourselves then we're open to the natural movements of emotions and perceptions that aren't about separation, but they're on the other spectrum as we learn not to separate and we're in harmony with ourself. Now we get a whole host of other emotions, joy, 
well-being, a deep sense of unchanging peace, ease, qualities that we have innate within us, we're learning how to, in a way, mine them back to the surface when we're living out of that sense of non-separation. I find it interestingly paradoxical because then we can be in a moment of deep sadness, deep grief, deep physical or psychological pain, and yet we're full of joy, a deep sense of peace, and an underlying well-being that we come to realize is indestructible, unbreakable, ever-present, amidst whatever else we might be experiencing as a human being. Do you think it's the capacity to hold the two polarities at the same time that defines spiritual and emotional well-being? You're on to a really lovely piece here because opposites, everything to me arrives with its opposite. So sadness, happiness, comfort, discomfort, uh, joy, grief, separation, non-separation. So we're learning in a way as we grow in our facility as a human being to welcome these polarities and not refuse either end because we see some people grow up in families where there's some kind of psychological or physical abuse. So joy and happiness are associated and love are associated with abuse. And so they cannot welcome in deep joy. Other people like me, I grew up and became depressed or you go into alcoholism. So we have all these ways, I call them exiting behaviors where we're trying to get away from our pain, but what we're in a way trying to do is get back to that central, essential joy or happiness. So we need to learn how to play, as you're saying, in these fields of opposites that are just part of being human and being open to both polarities. And what I find interestingly, and the research shows it, when we're willing to hold two opposites at the same time, it brings us into a third. This that doesn't know a sense of separation that opens us up to I would say, a quality of awareness that's just openness itself. Now we're open and receptive to information we otherwise wouldn't have been able to access. So a big part of the work I do with yoga, nidra, and meditation is helping people first feel whatever they're experiencing, be it a physical sensation, a psychological emotion, or some kind of thought, image, memory, belief, and find out where they feel that in their body. So it's very somatic oriented. Then to find what might be the opposite of that, feel that in their body, go back in between these two somatic states, and then to settle into holding them both at the same time. Not to go beyond them, not to bring them together, but to hold them at the same time, because that's when we access a whole different part of our nervous system that puts us into the present moment. Because often when we're held in one opposites, grief or sadness, or for many people, just happiness or joy, we're actually stuck in old memory, old conditioning. Holding opposites takes us out of that past conditioning. We cannot feel or hold two opposites at the same time and be in our thinking mind. We can't be in our past conditioning. It opens us up to a moment of insight that we otherwise might never have. So it's a very powerful and very simple intervention. It absolutely is. And speaking of um, this conditioning, these patterns, programming, I'm really, I've come to the realization that maybe waking up looks a lot more like breaking down. And this idea of deconstructing, is it the ego? Is it the illusion of separation? Is it the conditioning? What is it that we're deconstructing? Uh, let me put it into the frame that I teach out of, because I think of four phases here. Waking in, to me, is the first phase of becoming an integrated human being, where we're becoming friendly terms with all of our emotional life, our cognitive life, 
we're learning how to be on friendly terms with our body, mind, senses, and emotions, then in that kind of integrated ability, now there's a waking up phase where we're in a way going beyond and deconstructing our sense of self as a separate individual. Because I think as a phase of that waking in, we're beginning to become, as Jung and others have said, an integrated, individuated, healthy human being operating on all 12 cylinders. But we're still feeling ourselves very separate. I think that's part of the ego development at around 18 months of age, between 18 months and 24 months, a sense of self that's separate comes online for everyone. I actually remember the moment that it came online because the moment before there was no sister, there was no room, there was no beds, no windows, no walls. And then a moment later, there was a sister standing in front of me. There were walls, windows, doors, floors, everything got a name and a sense of separation. And when I, when I look back, I realized in that moment, I didn't know what was happening. But that was the moment, I think, when I started to feel that sense of separation that ultimately took me into the depression the further I got away. So part of healthy ego development is becoming an individuated, healthy, functioning sense of self that feels itself individuated and separate. Waking up is reawakening that primordial aspect we knew as babies where there was no sense of separation, no sense of other. But as a baby, we're swimming in that kind of primordial soup, but we don't know it because we don't have the cognitive ability. As that cognitive ability comes along, so does that ego development and that sense of separation, which is to me a part of natural human development. But then we have the ability to self-recognize this underlying essence that we probably left and weren't uh, rewarded for as children, because our families didn't know about it. They had left years before. Waking up to me is reawakening that sense of underlying essence and bringing it back to the forefront of awareness as a self-awareness. So now we are aware of our essence so we are both that essence that we were as babies, but now we're aware of being that essence. And now we're swimming in that essence. That to me is the waking up. And in that, there can be, as happened to me, a leaving behind that sense of being a separate individual. And I remember very distinctly sitting with my wife on the couch exclaiming how beautiful it was to feel this non-separation and this sense of unity and no other. And she said, I actually want a somebody. I don't want a nobody. And I said, but isn't this wonderful? She said, no, it's not really wonderful in relationship. I want a somebody to relate to. And after a couple of years, that integrated, and we were sitting on the very same couch, and she turned to me and she said, something's different. It feels like you're back. And I said, actually, I feel the same as I did before, but there's a, something that's integrated here, and it does feel like I'm here, and I can both be your unique other while there is no other here between us. And thankfully, she came to understand that in her own experience as well. So we get to celebrate that beauty of being distinct and unique, in relationship, and yet still feel that underlying essence that's not separate. So I think of that waking up as really embodying that essence. Then I think there's another phase. I call it waking back down. That's that phase I had to go through of reintegrating being with my emotions, being with my body perceptions, and yet still feeling that underlying essence. And then a fourth phase I call waking out. Now we integrate it into our relationships, into our work. Now we're really becoming a fully functional human being, awake, knowing no separation. And yet we can walk through the world 
as if, as one of my teachers said to me, he said, you're now an as if, as if you're separate, but you know you're not. So we use the language, don't we? I, me, you, your. So I will say, I'm hungry and I'd love to go to dinner and I'd love to go to dinner with you. But inside what I'm experiencing is hunger's arising, wanting to go to dinner is arising, wanting to go to dinner with this is arising. But if I were to say that out in public, they'd probably put me in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a mental institute. So it's interesting to walk in the world without any sense of separation and yet fully functioning as if we're separate individuals. I think that's really what this is all about. It absolutely is. You talked about integration in terms of the integration of the ego, in terms of the integration of the polarized opposites the in the feeling of, spectrum. And the integration of this underlying essence of no separation. Is integration then the solution? Is that the key? I feel it is because we, we are here. We do each are unique. And yet there is this underlying essence we can all tap into that's innate within us. So now we can feel our uniqueness. You have a personality that's very different from mine. And, and I love being in a room and looking very quickly at different people in the room because you can see immediately very different personalities, very different energy fields, very different uniquenesses. And yet to feel that underlying essence that connects us all now we can have communication, we can have relationship. What I say is we can celebrate differences, we can even celebrate places where we don't agree. But there's an impossibility of doing war. Because if we know that the other is ourself, just with different clothes, hair, facial expressions, there's no way to go to war with them because it doesn't make sense. We'd be going to war with ourselves. So I find in relationship, here's where this quality of love really blossoms because in a way we're falling in love with ourself in another form and celebrating that form even in the midst of places where we might hold differences. So now we can have those differences but we're not going to go to war. It just doesn't make sense. If that can happen for me individually, can I then translate that for the collective? If you and I are being that, so we could say we're being peace, we're being that sense of non-separation, we're, we're embodied that sense of well-being, that's the field that you are. So anybody who walks into that field can't maintain their sense of separation. And here's where the rub is, because my first mentor had no sense of separation. When I would enter into her field, at times it became scary because it was disassembling, deconstructing my own reality of how I had built my own self-image. So her field was dissembling, we might say, that structured reality or conditioning, which ultimately she helped me break through so I could feel that underlying essence and all sense of fear fell away. But there's the rub, isn't it? When someone comes into your field, at first, they'll feel a lovely sense of essence, peace. I've actually had on two occasions people who I didn't know plop down next to me and say, I don't know what you have, but how do I get it? <laughs> so that's the first blush. But if they stay in your field, basically what's going to start to happen is they're going to begin to run into their own self-image because you're not playing the game of self-image. You're just being an authentic human being, speaking your truth, being authentic and spontaneous. Conditioning makes us more rigid. So they're going to run into that rigidity with themselves. And if they can stay with it, then there can be that 
sense of deconstruction that you mentioned earlier. There, so there is a deconstruction of our self-representations, the way we've formulated an identity based on self-representations. In order to stay in separation, I have to project you over there as a separate image, a separate representation. I've built that rep rep representation into my own mind. I've projected that onto you because that's what I have to do for myself. I have to relate to myself then out of self-image, self-representations that are cognitive and have been assembled over time and I'm holding them in memory. So I start to formulate you in memory too to keep that sense of separation. The moment I start to feel that underlying essence, I have to step out of memory. I have to step out of those self-representations into the immediacy of this moment that isn't even the now, past, future, now are still representations. Those have to completely drop. I have to drop out of my thinking mind into what I call my heart or essence mind, which is a kind of a working ability to be here. But now we're not operating from image to image from self-representation to self-representation. It is now essence to essence, where interestingly we have access to all of that, but we're no longer held by it. And I love it because yoga nidra as, a, as an art and science, meditation in general, it's helping us to be so super sensitive. The moment we begin to step back and get solidified in that self-representation, that self-image, which is a kind of a protective mechanism. And we'll, we'll start to feel something doesn't feel right because we're starting to separate. And by catching it, we can see, oh, I'm starting to fall into a belief or an image, and we can deconstruct it right there and then and keep in that quality of essence of being in our relationship even as all the emotions, all the thoughts, all the memories are still there. I love that you just talked about a continuous process of deconstruction. And, and you talked about this mirror effect and the projection in the holographic reality yes. that we live in um, and that we are reflecting and projecting all the time in. And that makes me think of inner worlds and outer worlds. So does my outer world really reflect my inner vibration, my energetic state all the time? How does that work? I don't think of inner and outer world because in that essence, there is no inner and there is no outer. At that essence level, we don't feel any sense of boundary. There is a kind of a multidimensional openness. So there's an equality even as we're face to face, in that essence, there can be as much of an awareness of what's in front as is behind, as left and right, below, above, inside and outside. So the boundaries begin to melt away. If I come back, I can feel how that essence has both then a paradoxical, localized, field-like quality about it that gives a sense of border and boundary especially if I look down at my skin or touch it, it gives the impression there's a boundary here. But if I just stay with that essence, whether eyes are open or closed, there is no border or boundary. There is no inside, outside. Now, that said, what I understand is we're expectation, image-generating machines, we might say. Our brain is constantly building self-representations of what is coming in as information. What we see around us is just energy. But our brain has been formulated in such a way that it is able to construct images out of those energetic patterns that then we come to a consensual reality, don't we? We say together, I see a wall or the rug is purple. We have a consensual kind of reality here. Our brains are unique and 
the color blue, if you were to put my eyes on your brain, you might be seeing red. But for you, it's we've consensually agreed that it's blue. So I'm aware our brain is assembling self-representations or representations of what we're so-called seeing as an outer world and then relating to it through those images. And part of waking up is seeing those representations and seeing through them. So even as our mind is building them, we are in a process, as you said, of constant deconstruction. And I'm aware as soon as we deconstruct one image, the brain is already assembling a new one. So it is a never-ending constancy. The beauty is when we get caught in them as if they're true, and now we believe that they're true, we'll start to feel something's not right. The, the catch here is the ego structure, if it hasn't been truly understood in its function, in its role, mm -hmm. it will come along and it will say, not just something's not right here, but I'm not right. Something's wrong, something's wrong with me. And it'll solidify into that representation or that image. Part of waking up to me is seeing how the ego functions. It's just a function. We're not going to get rid of this sense of separation. We're learning how to be amidst it without getting fused and caught in it. So now as expectations are arising, which a lot of them serve us, don't they? You got on a plane from England to come to the United States, and you had the expectation that you would arrive at some time in the United States. That's a nice expectation to have, and luckily you did. And you had an expectation that you had rented an Airbnb, and it would be here waiting for you, in which case it did. But what had happened if you got to this Airbnb and there were people already living here, you'd get a little frustrated. I was catching a plane uh, and I was late for it. And as I got to the gate, the a flight attendant shut the door in front of my face. And I turned to the, because she was on the other side of the, of the door. I turned to the uh, attendant next to me and I said, can you open the gate? I, you know, I door, I just got here. She said, no, once the door is shut, it's shut. And I could see my expectation, frustration, you know, starting. But instead of getting caught in it, I turned to her and I asked, is there another flight to San Francisco? And she said, yeah, two gates down. I ran down and there were two seats left. I got on the plane and I was on a plane to San Francisco. As I was leaving, there was a guy right next to me who was getting all frustrated in his expectation, getting out of control, yelling at the flight attendant. He didn't hear that there was a flight to two gates down. He didn't make that second seat that was still available. So we can see when we have an expectation, we can either feel something's not right, which is our body's feedback that we're starting to get caught and fused in an expectation, recognize it, step into the present moment, and, and see now we're open to new creative moment. If we get fused, we'll get stuck in the emotion of frustration, which is just a signal. We don't recognize it as a signal. Now we're getting angry, hostile, going to war, when in fact it was just trying to signal us, hey, you're fighting with reality. You thought that the gate would stay open or that they'd open it for you. Reality is saying they're not. And I've come to appreciate when we fight with reality, we always lose. And it's not a 99, 1%, it's 100%. Fight with reality, 100%, we're gonna get frustrated. And that frustration is just helping us see we're fighting with reality, drop it. There's a new reality here. Let's welcome it and come into it. There's a um, myth. I'm gonna deconstruct my sense of how I've assembled reality, come into this new awakefulness and the deal is done. I'll never have to do any more deconstruction, and it's just not the case. 
as one fellow Alma says, it's a runaway train. Awakening is a never ending process. And that deconstruction is always going to be happening over and over and over again. So we're constantly going to be having new conditioning that's being built, that's serving us in the moment, and then it's going to get re uh, deconstructed again. One of my yoga teachers talked about turning emotional commotion into emotional devotion. And I think the driving force actually, I mean, there are a number of driving forces. We all are searching for happiness and a unchanging happiness. We're going about it often in all the ways that don't work. There's an inner well-being and happiness that's already here. And I think devotion, curiosity, patience, persistence, perseverance, these are all the energy fuelings that are taking us ultimately to this goal of awakening. And love has to ultimately be the driving force. Because when I think of that underlying essence that connects us all, words that come to my mind aren't just peace and well-being, but the underlying really one is love. And what I'm aware of is our eyes, in a way, are the windows, we call it, to the soul, but they're the windows to the heart. And when we look out from essence meeting essence, it's going to awaken that essence of heart that is love, that is that sense of devotion. And then, in a manner of speaking, if we understand there is only this mysterious essence that has given birth to us and everything, that means everything is that essence. There isn't anything in the universe that isn't that essence. So that means all of our emotions, thoughts, body perceptions, everything from happiness to discomfort, pain, distress, sadness, they're all that essence in a unique form. So in a way, what we're learning in these teachings, we might say, is to appreciate that everything is essence and falling in love with everything. So when physical pain comes now, I'm not saying, how do I get rid of it? I'm saying, oh, isn't this interesting? This is that essence coming in this form. What's my response as essence to essence? What is it that is most being wanted here? So I would say devotion, and love are the underlying driving forces, ultimately. It is just, we're all made out of love, in, in a manner of speaking. Oh, Dr. Miller, that is so beautifully put. Along those lines, is altruism a sort of bulletproof vest, so to speak? Is that something that can help us as, an, as a currency, as an energetic exchange, perhaps a tool to turn commotion into devotion? as long as it stays in its pure form, because the ego in its undeveloped or non-integrated form will appropriate anything that's arising. That's what it's designed to do, is appropriate and take ownership and pretend that it's the agency. Altruism, like compassion, kindness, love, to me is a natural quality that's innate to all of us. It can get corrupted as the ego takes hold of it and appropriates it. And so now, rather than the inner feeling of altruism is present, it is altruism in a way that's expressing itself in this movement. The I gets in there and says, I'm being altruistic. Aren't I great? And now havoc starts to get slowly corrupting that sense of altruism. So any of these qualities, kindness, compassion, love, altruism, to me, these are the pure forms as we rest in essence. I find it's only natural for us to feel, what can I do to serve humanity? It doesn't, it's not all about me anymore. There's this beautiful saying in Buddhism, the Bodhisattva vow. I vow to save all sentient beings. To me, when I think of that, there isn't 
another sentient being. I mean, there is an appearance of separation, but in fact, there's just that essence. So that vow really means until every sentient being out there who takes themselves to be a separate sentient being awakens to that deep essence, I'm still suffering because they are me. So the bodhisattva vow to me is actually a very selfish vow, all about me, because there isn't anybody else. And part of my depression was a sense of alienation and a sense of this separation that I lived in. And when I really woke up and realized there was no other, I got the joke. I actually laughed because I realized my alienation was simply thinking uh, that there are others and how do I be a good other when I realized there isn't another alienation and depression just blinked out. There was that underlying essence and that sense of unity and harmony with the entire universe. So back to your statement, yeah, I think altruism is a pure form that lives within all of us. It is the saving grace where we recognize everybody as ourself. And so we're serving a so-called other, but in fact, we're just serving ourself in another form. So I think of people like Jesus, Buddha, and others like them who are very self-centered, selfless, selfish people because they didn't see anybody else but themselves. So that lovely kind of paradox there. That really helps me understand oneness uh, in a new way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So beautiful offering. Um, along those lines, I'm wondering at a mass level, yoga nidra, and can it be used in sort of a mass meditative way to affect the global consciousness and, and Earth's electromagnetic fields? Absolutely, because we are each a field of that essence. And when we meditate together, and it doesn't matter whether I'm here and you're in England, but when we're meditating together, time and space don't actually exist. They're a figment of representation. So it's been well proven in science. You tweak an atom in France, and its sister atom <clears throat> will tweak in New York. Or the Chinese did it on the space station, and they tweaked uh, an electron or a part of the atom on the space station, and its sister rather tweaked back on the Earth at the same moment. We know that there is no separation. We can, for practical purposes, project a sense of time and space and separation. That's the way we live as social human beings. So when we're meditating, whether wherever you are, whether you're here with me or we're apart in so-called space and time, we are that field. And the more we sit in that field, the bigger that field, we might say, begins to emanate and radiate. So that's going to affect everybody around us. Add more and more people to that field, that's going to have a larger and larger effect on humanity and everything else in the cosmos. I do agree with the statement, the wing of the butterfly that butters on the other side of the universe affects how I'm feeling here on the other side of that universe. We are all inseparably interconnected. So the emotion, the feeling that I'm having, I know is a product not just of the field that I am, but of the entire universe. And the more we come into alignment with that, that's going to change how everybody sees reality and how they interrelate both with themselves and the respect that I see that then comes when we realize everything is our self, Mother Earth is our self, we are going to treat her with the same respect we would treat our own body. So that that sense of disrespect, if I see a piece of garbage as I'm walking along, pick it up. It's my living room. I'm not interested in throwing paper down on my living room 
So I pick it up, put it in my pocket, and then put it in a receptacle that's appropriate. It just feels to me that just makes sense. Do you think that we live in an ascension machine? Well, I think we are each this, as you would say, ascension machine. We Sentience to me means we have that ability to perceive emotions, sensations, thoughts, all these different perceptions we're having through our senses from a so-called outside world. So our ability to be sentient it means we can be awake to all those qualities then that are feedback systems that are constantly showing us how to navigate in a sense that gives us a sense of harmony. There's a beautiful word in Sanskrit, most people know it, dharma, the work we do in the world. But the root of dharma is what most people don't know. It's a beautiful word, rutta, R-T-A. Rutta means to be living in such a way you feel in harmony with the totality of the universe in each moment. When I'm living my dharma, that means I am living in such a way I feel in harmony, not just here, but with the totality of the universe. I don't feel separate. So there's a switch over that I find from that sense of being an integrated, awake human being to be a really awake human being to that essence is there's a switch over from my will to thy will where there is no difference now. So I wake up in the morning when I lie there, the first thing I do, I let my senses in my body wake up and come back online feeling that sense of essence, the body and the mind are waking up in it as they go to sleep at night. But then as I'm lying there, I'm also then asking myself, while I'm asking the universe, okay, what are our marching orders today? So for me, I'm trying to follow those marching orders that have been given to me that keep me in a sense of harmony all day long, no matter where I am or whom I'm with. And I've come to deeply appreciate the moment I move left or right of those marching orders, I'll start to feel something's not right, which stops me in my tracks to look at where am I separating from that underlying harmony, get back into it and move. And my feeling is we all have an inner gyroscope. We all have a true compass. We may have strayed from it and these these practices are helping us come back to that inner guidance, that inner gyroscope that keeps us on true north as we navigate life. Thy will be done, right? Thy, thy will be done. I know who I work for. <laughs> you, put, you just mentioned something that brought to my attention ascension and sentience both have sense in them. Mm -hmm. So there's a common root word going on. I should have seen it before, but... Mm -hmm being blonde, you know. <laughs> um, it makes me think of the subtle senses, one of the ten bodies, the subtle body in yogic terms. Uh, do you think then that subtle sense is important to, uh, as a muscle to pump? Absolutely, and I think of the practices as helping us grow the, those muscles. And, you know, we have so many more than five senses because we're aware of gravity, we're aware of electromagnetism. There are so many subtle senses we can develop that help us attune in ever deeper levels. The subtle body is occupying this physical body, but the subtle body is really what's animating the physical body. Without the subtle body, the physical body would just collapse. So we're really attuning to this deeper, subtle body that is actually moving my arm. So I have a whole teaching where I'm helping people move from moving a physical arm to feeling that energy or that subtle body moving, and then to feel the subtle body taking the physical body with it. So we're actually moving around, we might say, in the quality of the dream body we're in, in dreaming. And part of Yoga Nidra isn't just about learning to navigate waking life, but it's learning how to navigate 
dream and sleep life where we're in that subtle body that is plastic. It's can do anything. It can fly. It can walk through uh, walls. And we're realizing that that's a whole nother reality that we can learn how to live and be in. And what I love about dream yoga is in the dream, we know we can't be hurt. In waking life, we have a belief that we can be hurt. Part of the teachings is to awaken to something within us, this essence that can't be hurt, can't be harmed, never needs healing because it's never sick. The body, I agree, has times where it needs to be healed or it can be sick. If we know ourselves as this wholeness, we won't make the mistake of saying, I'm sick. If you ask me, how, how am I? There's only one thing I can say. I'm fine. You're going to have to say, well, how's your body? And the dream body, we can learn how to play in that subtle body that we realize can't be harmed. And so we can use it to move through all of our fears, all of our traumas, and then learn how to do that both in the dream and in the waking life. And that to me is what meditation yoga nidra is really about, learning how to navigate all these states and understand ourselves as this that is sentient, ascension, and is always present and can't be harmed 